Hello, everybody. Good evening. And uh, I want to say thank you right off the top to Politics and Prose and to the Washington Post for having me here and for hosting this, uh, this great event. So I hope it's going to be an exciting kind of a conversation and good questions. I'm going to rate always people that interview me from 1 to 10. So let's see <laughs> where you're going to rank. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm looking forward to uh, watching the debate just like everyone else because we have heard so much of the rhetoric uh, from both sides. And uh, I think to me what is always important is that uh, A, uh, you know, uh, how do you go beyond the likability, who is likable, who is funny, who has a great personality and all those things and get through uh, and try to figure out who is really capable of getting the job done. And that means who is really capable of bringing both of the parties together. Because as you can see, Nothing is getting done in Washington right now. As a matter of fact, it's the, it's, it's, it's the most frozen place that I've ever seen, uh, you know, since I've been in this country. In 2004, you had a moment um, on, at the Republican National Convention in Madison Square Garden that you said was an immigrant's dream come true. You got to speak to your whole party. Now this summer, uh, the GOP brought in Clint Eastwood, another action action hero, who had his own way of doing things. I, I, I wonder. Yeah, if, I would if, say. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what you would have done with that opportunity this summer. Well, I think that, uh, you know, this is a rare opportunity that you get invited to a convention and to be, like I was in 2004, a keynote speaker. So I wanted to take that seriously and really give uh, a good speech, practice the speech, right. make sure that I feel really comfortable with it. And because it's very intense when you go out there in front of 20,000 people and you have to speak, you're working off teleprompters, you don't know who the person is that operates the teleprompter, <laughs> you don't know if you start improvising and getting off the teleprompter, if they start rolling forward and then you can't catch up and you don't know anymore where you are in a speech. Uh, all of those things sometimes, uh, like what happened to me, <laughs> you know, you, all of a sudden uh, you have all the teleprompters uh, not really show any of the writing mm -hmm. because people were in front of uh, the teleprompter with white signs. So the white writing on the teleprompter and the white signs all planned together and I couldn't see anything. So, you know, this is really like freak out city when you're out there, you're standing there and you don't see what you're going to go and say next. Uh, so those kind of things. So, so you have to really practice rehearse and think about what you're really trying to communicate. Clint had his own style. I mean, you know, when you invite Clint Eastwood, Clint Eastwood has his own style of communicating, you know, and he's not a, a, a conservative right-wing guy. Mm -hmm. He's very much in the middle, you know. He worked in my administration when I was governor, and he was in charge of the parks and recreational facilities and so on, and he did a terrific job in that. Uh, but, you know, everyone has his own style, like I in the debates. I felt when I was debating, since my strength was not policy in 2003, right. my strength was uh, me. You know, and, uh, and, and so therefore, I, I went there and did not let myself get down to a, a policy details. I, I could tell them that, yes, I want to do health care reform, and yes, I want to do uh, you know, uh, immigration reform, and yes, I want to go and rebuild California and all those things and get rid of the budget deficit and so. But when it got into the details, I rather used comedy, and used humor. Right. So that was the important thing. And that's why Ariana Huffington played into all my stuff, you know, that she was perfect. She kept whining, oh, Arnold, you always say this, and you are always, you know, this. Oh, you're terrible. You're making so much money. And, you know, it was, she was this whiny woman sitting there. And I said to myself, I'm going to get her. And bang, you know, I said, I said, you know something? I just got an idea. I said, when I do Terminator 4, you're going to play the female Terminator next movie. You know, and she was outraged she said, because she just saw Terminator 3, where I took the female Terminator and stuck her head in the toilet. So, so, so she, she immediately said, this is outrageous the way you deal with women. This is so typical of Schwarz and Schnitzel. I mean, it's terrible. He wants to put my head in the toilet. I said, yeah, well, I said, well, what's wrong with that? But anyway, so this is how the debates went. So the people were howling, they were laughing, because what happens is when you go to those debates, everyone sits there like this. <laughs> they are just, you know, they, they, they are just really like, there's the suspense, oh, so-and-so is coming out now, and so-and-so, and they're going to debate, and they're, let's see who is going to be better. But, it, you know, it's, I, I saw right away the intense look of, of the people, and I said, I've got to lighten up this atmosphere here, and as soon as I did, it broke the ice, and from then on, I started winning the people over, and in the end, as sad as it is sometimes, but personality wins over the, 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 all the details and throwing around numbers and statistics and all that stuff. 
And so I came out that 64% of, uh, of the people went uh, to my direction uh, after the debate. I mean, Sly came to me while I was getting my hair done. <laughs> Isn't there a salon where you both go? That's right, yeah. There's somebody else too, right? The, 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 the Mickey Rourke, Rourke, I mean, a lot of people go there. And so, so I had the, my hair dye in the hair, I was getting my color done. <laughs> very important on your way to Bulgaria, right? <laughs> Sly is standing there next to me and says, <laughs> and he starts talking to me. And uh, he said to me, he says, hey, uh, I have everyone together now. I have fantastic stars and expendables. He says, can you do a cameo? And I said to him, of course. We don't even have to talk about it. Don't call my agent, by the way, I said, because they're going to charge you money. So the next thing I knew was, I'm now sitting with him at lunchtime uh, at Cafe Roma, and he says to me, he says, hey Arnold, uh, I'm about to close the script and all this. He says, can you do me a favor? Can you be back again in the second Expendables? And eventually they're gonna do a third one, so maybe in the third one I'm gonna work four weeks. <laughs> you know, so, I know, so this is how we're gonna escalate it. And I know that this whole book tour has had a challenge for you, that, that you've, uh, I know that this isn't a therapy session, um, but I know it takes a big man to, you know, admit these big mistakes that you do in this, yeah. this chapter call, uh, called The Very Secret. Big. <laughs> now, now, I, I wonder why, what you achieve in, in talking about it so publicly when you admit, really, that it's hard for your family to hear these things in public. Well, I mean, I don't tell the media what they should ask. So if someone asks you a question, you have to answer it. Otherwise, don't do the interview. Mm -hmm. Don't go on 60 Minutes. Don't go on uh, the morning shows and, and all of those things. It is expected. The way it works is that you can have uh, 640 pages of material in the book here. Mm -hmm. And uh, 10 pages of that is about the scandal. Uh, so even though it is, represents 1% you know, uh, uh, only uh, or 2% of the, of, this, uh, of the whole book, but the fact of the matter is people still will focus on that and will ask that as the first question. So you can't avoid to have to answer those questions now or if I have to answer it later on when I, do, when I come out with my next movie, I might as well just answer it now. And I think that the people have a right to know because this book is about my life. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to paint my life as if it is the perfect life and I've only had victories but I had never made a mistake and I never had any defeats or losses or anything like this. So this book deals with the, 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 the losses that I had in movies, the mistakes that I made in movies, the mistakes I made in politics and the horrible mistake that I made also in a personal life and what that what was the outcome of that? How much pain did it cost uh, uh, to my family, to my wife, and to my children? And uh, you know, that's why I don't really go into minute details because I know that my children are listening to the interviews and watching those interviews and so on, but I got to face up to it and I got to talk about it rather than just walking. It's, it's not my style to walk the other way and to run away from the problem. It's a problem that I created. It was totally my fault. It was no one else's fault, and therefore I have to face, the, the, uh, face up to it. I just have one more idea about it. In, in reflecting about it, did, did you look back at the decision when you actually knew uh, what had happened, that, that Mildred had your child? And, and have you thought about how keeping them in the same household complicated the whole healing for the family, ultimately? Uh, yeah, I thought about that. And, and does it make you, <laughs> is it something you want to wanna take back and, and wish you could do it all over again? Oh look, we all much smarter in hindsight, that's for sure. But the bottom line is, that's what I did. Mm -hmm. That's the way I handled it. The way I dealt with the whole thing is as good as I could deal with it. Uh, if it was wrong or right, it's now too late, mm -hmm. you know, to think about it. And uh, that's why I wrote about it in the book and dealt with it in an honest way in the book. And, um, you know, and I, I know that it is painful for my kids and, and for my wife to hear it over and over, those kind of things. But, uh, you know, time heals all. And I